Hey, Clemens. Hello. How you doing? I'm doing well. That's good. Yes. But the day went by like nothing, which means I have a lot to do, which is uh, great. Yeah, it's better than the opposite. That is definitely true. Yeah. Um, and I did, and I finally did some reviews of things. Yeah, I noticed your review about um, Clement, not Clement, gem, Gems PR. So that was good. But don't just to nag you, you have a couple of outstanding things on the waiting for updates uh, thing. Yeah, 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 I know. And okay. I have been um, flagging, but I've been doing all kinds of busy work on, on related matters uh, with uh, discovery and subscriptions and et cetera, where we're trying to get, get on, on aligned with SAP and then bring, we'll bring the, uh, uh, the essence of that. That'd be cool. Oh, wait, wait before I have one slide that I, I can have one slide that I made that I'll sh that I can show show um, later, which okay. is specifically around um, interop, uh, sorry discovery, and and one scenario how discovery might work. Okay, hey, did you get a chance to read uh, Eric's issue that he opened up last week? Yes, and I think. Um, so, so if I understood this right, um, he's kind of worried about like multi-level, multi-stage routing aggregation in the middle, and how we can go and model that. I think. I'm and, not I, sure. and I replied to that issue and included a picture, um, one of my slides that I've been using for OPC. OPC UA and some of the federation issues we have there. And I think um, once you have these multi-level routing things, you really, from a subscriber perspective, you only see the, the party that's publishing to you. Like there's, yes, you can go and have a 30,000 foot view on the pipeline um, of, of what that total flow is. But I think from the cloud events perspective and what we're trying to achieve here from the interop perspective, the consumer only gets to see kind of the next hop that's immediately in front of them. Which right. means, which means that um, there is nothing to control five hops down from that perspective. Like there's nothing you can do um, um, from a interop protocol perspective to make things better. But you can obviously be, try to be smart about how you, um, how much data you're acquiring based on the subscription that you manage. Well, right. That 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 was actually going to be one of my questions to Eric was because I did place the question in there either last night or this morning. I can't remember which one. Where I was trying to figure out if he's trying to do sort of a multi-subscribe, multi-subscription subscribe kind of a thing, and then if he is, is he just looking for possible? guidance or something on how to actually specify that, you know, it's almost like nested subscribes in a sense. Yeah, I'm not I, sure we necessarily want to support that directly, but how could he kind of bastardize things to make it work is what I was wondering. I have, I have, been, I have the, the slide that I, that I, that I want to show um, is solving one of those, it's trying to solve one of those problems. And that's, um, well, you'll see when I, when I talk about it. Okay. Okay. Anyway, let's get, let's do the, uh, the fun stuff here. <laughs> okay. Oh, hey, Mark. All right, let me start at the top of my list here. David. Good morning. Good morning. And Tommy, yo. 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 Christian. Howdy. Howdy. And Klaus. Hi, Doc. Hello. Um, Priyanka, I don't see her yet. Scott. Doug. Hello. And whoa, I managed to do that. All right, Timur. Hi. Hello, and Matt. Hello. Hello, and then I saw someone go by. How? H-A-O, hello. Uh, da -da -da. Simon. Hello. Yep. Hello. And Vlad. Good morning, Doug. Hello. Do -do -do -do.
Wow, small group today. It's weird. Hey, Jesse. Good morning. Hello. Remy. Hey. Hey. All right. Just a little over a minute, then we'll get started. I guess I should warn you, my machine has been doing some really weird stuff today and I did just reboot it, so it should be okay. But between that and the ice storm that we're kind of getting here, um, I can't guarantee that I won't lose connectivity. So if I vanish, it's not because you guys pissed me off. It's just things went horribly, horribly wrong. Mind those Bitcoins. <laughs> uh, hey, Eric. Hello. Hey. Oh, who was that? Manuel. Manuel, uh, gotcha. Okay. All right, just a couple more seconds, then we'll get started here. I'm not sure I can handle one other person named Davis in the group. All right, all right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, okay, those of you on the call, you have some AIs, keep remember that. All right, community time. Anything from the community people want to bring up? All right, moving forward then. Um, I can't remember if we actually talked to anything with that scale call last week. If we did, I'm sure it was very quick. But we do have a discovery interrupt call after this one. Um, I suspect we're probably gonna end early. So if you're interested in that, hang on for that. Uh, Timur offline mentioned that they had no real updates, just chugging away at their PRs and stuff. So we can jump right into the fun. And Jem, since you joined, you're gonna be up first. However, um, are there any PRs or issues you wanna add to the list that I may have skipped over? I have something to talk about for discovery, um, just as a as an update on some of the work that we've been we've been doing with, uh, or some thoughts um, that we're having how to make things work with Klaus. And Klaus plays at work, so I don't know when okay. you want to go and cover this. I have, I have one slide that I want to show. Okay, but let's see where that fits in. Uh, I, I think these are going to go fairly quick, so let's see. Okay. Should we have plenty of time? All right, Jim, you are up first. Oops, I already have it open. Would you like to talk about your, let me hide the comments first here. Hold on a sec. Do, do, do. Would you like to talk about this issue or PR, Jim? Look, since you put me on the spot, I guess I don't have much option. That's um, true. Yes. <laughs> so um, uh, somebody mentioned that this topic had come up um before you know how could we you know or could we come up with a mechanism of of uh, signing or at least sharing um signatures for events um and to be transparent this is actually an issue that we're looking at internally today so we have a scenario where um we have potentially geographically dispersed um systems that need bilateral trust between the publisher and the and the eventual consumer um, but also the um, infrastructure in the middleware that's sort of doing the distribution also needs to do um, bilateral trust between you know nodes within that infrastructure as well so um, uh, so I started down this road. Um, I, I think the the internal bilateral trust is a slightly different use case, which can be addressed maybe through Russian dolling, actually the whole cloud event. Um, but I started to 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 think about how we might attach signatures and then um, 
how we might also sign attributes. Um, and I know a number of people, including Doug, had sort of commented on um, maybe coming up with a different way of doing the attribute signing. But the basic premise here is that we reserve some um, extension attributes to carry the signature. Um, the uh, algorithm used for that signature uh, and separate the, uh, the signature of the data payload from the signature um, that might be used for attributes. And the model that I'd actually come up with, which was the first one that fell out of my brain, which is not flexible enough, I don't think, is this notion of saying, I will sign uh, the required attributes, or I'll sign the required plus the optional attributes, all, or I'll sign all of them. Um, but as a number of people have pointed out, you know, it, since we allow intermediaries to put additional um, attributes into the cloud event, um, it may well be that I need to come up with a, a more flexible mechanism to indicate which um, which attributes in that particular uh, event have been subject to the signing. Uh, Clemens, I, I think you, you'd you sort of made a reference to S-MIME. Uh, I did comment back in the, in the PR from, as I understand it, S-MIME uses multi-part bodies. Yeah, so it stuffs signatures in, in a second body part. Um, it, and so if we can think of a different way, I mean, I, obviously I'm completely open to that, but I mean, we don't support multi-part data today. So, I mean, from, from my perspective, the only way that I could add a signature was to put it in an attribute, in a context attribute. Yeah, um, the, the, I, I think it's worth, it's, have, you, have you read to rest mine? No, I read the Wikipedia page on it. <laughs> no, 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 that doesn't count here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, come on. I, I just need enough knowledge to um, to say I've got a problem with it and then find somebody who really knows how it works. Um, so I think the current the current RFC is uh, 8551. Um, and... Um, so, so SMIME solves the problem. So SMIME is there to go and take inter internet messages, which is headers followed by a body, um, which is how mail works, and which is also incidentally how um, HTTP messages work and, and a bunch of other messages work. Um, and, and apply signatures and crypto, and crypto to, to them. And it has solved the problem of of labeling um, headers that need to be signed, and it has a special header designated where the signature goes. It has metadata to indicate which which algorithm you want to go and use, and it has uh, headers that indicate uh, key hints, and it has all the stuff that you kind of need for um, for that kind of work. And that's why it's a thorough read of SMIME will be useful. I agree that. SMIME in the form that we have it, that, that it's there, might not be immediately applicable because of multi-part um, message bodies. Um, and, um, uh, but it, I can imagine that we can go and say, um, we're gonna carry a, a signed cloud event is actually carried inside of a, of a wrapping cloud event which is um, then ends up being uh, a mechanism that we can go where we can apply the the mechanisms of SMIME to. But I would the reason why I brought up SMIME is because it's it's something that is well understood generally also in the uh, in the security community, and where you have presumably um, also coverage from a library perspective, and um, it's something that is uh, somewhat reasonably tooled. Um, and so I'm, I'm, especially in this part, in this area, I'm a little worried about inventing a cloud event specific mechanism. Right. So I would, no, I, I, 
I got yeah. it. Yeah. So so as I would I would I would like for us to lean as much as possible on something that is that is um, that 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 the security people have have thought of long and hard. And there's currently two candidates I can think of. There is um, this the whole Josie stack. So that's the, the JSON security uh, signature and encryption. Um, so that's where uh, the, the the JSON web tokens come from and the JSON web signatures come from. And so that's all called Josie, J-O-S-E. -S um, that's a series of RFCs um, uh, in the IETF. Um, yeah, and so then- we, and I was gonna say, we use Josie. Yeah, um, I think the issue here is it, it's that I can use Josie end to end, you know, from yeah. publisher to consumer. Well, actually, even that, you know, that wouldn't cover the cloud event attributes. It would cover the we would stuff it in, you know, the data. Um, yeah. Well, but but now I layer this other level of intermediaries that then now need to wrap that with other stuff or mutate those headers along the way. Um, yeah. I think it gets a little bit complex. Yeah. Josie Josie is. Um, is a, th another reason why I'm a little worried about Josie is that Josie is a direct descendant of W Security, <laughs> um, and uh, so it carries a lot of the com those complexities with it. Like if you go and take that entire stack, um, it also is no accident that the that the folks who wrote the specs are the, the, the players are very similar uh, similar folks. Um, and you know those folks are brilliant. Let's 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 be clear about that. Um, and I find SMIME more attractive for our scenario because it's not trying to boil the ocean as much as Josie tries to. Right. Um, it, it literally is. SMIME try, has has a notion of there's a bunch of headers and there's a body and we need to go and and, and uh, transport a signature for those and probably go and encrypt the body in some way. It deals with those things in base 64. That's also something that we um, uh, that we need in at least in part. Um, so I think there is a toolbox here with in, in form of SMIME, which we can, if we can't use it as is, we can at least very liberally go and loot it. Good point. All right, I will do some deeper reading. That would be very nice of you if you did that. There's not going to be a test afterwards, is there? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Aside from Clemens, or I guess, Jim, is there anything you want to talk about specifically about the PR? Since it sounds like you may need to go back and do some revamping if what Clemens is suggesting is, is the path you want to go down. I will do some reading and then, and then come back. Yeah. Okay. In the meantime, are there any other questions or comments for Jim on the PR as it currently stands or on the discussion that Clemens and he were having. Yeah, I mean, I was curious if anybody else had sort of run up against this, um, this scenario, because I, I know it had, you know, somebody had raised it a while ago in one of the um, Slack channels, I think. Yeah, I think, I think we've had <clears throat> more than one person ask for some sort of signing mechanism. So it'd be good to have it there as a test or as a trial extension, yeah. All right, any last comments, questions for Jim? All right, cool. Thank you, Jim, for that. Uh, Slinky, I know you've been working really hard on this one. Would you like to update this on the status of here on this one? So I uh, just started looking uh, like a half an hour ago to the comments. Uh, generally, it seems it's going well. Uh, is there anybody that wants to do some more elaborate comments on the meeting. I know uh, Clements did different comments about um, type inference. So, yeah, I, I, I and, and about and about and about error handling too. Yeah, uh, and I thought and I thought that the the inference things would irk you most. Sorry, can you repeat? Yeah, I, I, I thought that the inference comment would uh, um, uh, would irk you most because that they end up that ends up being a little bit more work. Uh, 
it's not really about more work. It's generally that I, I, I generally don't like tight, tight imprints too much <laughs> sometimes. So it's just a, a sequel it's a does it. Personal. But, so as uh, really, if you think we should add it, uh, just give me some hint on how we want to do it and I'll go ahead. Um, go, go read the, go, go, simply, so, since, since I know that you have been, have, that are parts that were inspired by the MQP spec, you simply need to go, need to read further down the MQP spec and then you'll find the inference part. Okay. <laughs> okay. Is there anything in particular, Slinky, that you'd like to point out here, since I think um, more offline discussions are, are needed and, and they're happening, which is all great, yeah. but is there anything on the call today you wanted to bring out to for people's attention? I think you, I think you, Clements, might have misunderstood uh, the error handling. So the, uh, the, the idea of the, uh, the idea of the, um, of this language, and if it's, if, if it's not well explained, I can go and rewrite this part, is that because every operator, because, uh, because every expression is total, the evaluation flow is always defined up to the end. And then, uh, some functions can have the side effect of appending to a list of errors. So, in, and my idea with this is that we, um, the user can have a far greater flexibility of deciding whether errors, some errors are more critical than the others, some errors are, uh, should be treated as false, some errors should be treated as true, and so on. So I, I, didn't, I didn't want it to decide in the spec uh, whether an error is false or is true, okay? And, and ends up breaking the, the expression or not. That seems complicated. Like well, if, if, something, if, something, if, something, if something is, like if you have a division by zero, because you are having, so, so you are dividing by a value that you're getting through the message and now you're getting a division by zero. Can you ever return true or false? No, you can't. Well, that's the point. Every operator and function is total. So there is a definition for that. If you look in the operator, in the division operator, th there should be a definition whether wh what happens when uh, one of the operands is zero. But you have to throw. By division by zero, you have to throw because there's no, there is, it's undefined in math. Not if you define it. <laughs> That's my point. <laughs> yes, you can have in the operator. In the operator, you can have a definition of that. But it's undefined in math. It's undefined in math, and it's raising an error. And you can choose whether you want to have this error to treat the the filter as pass or not pass. That's what I mean. So it, 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 my point is that. It's an error, okay. We know that it's an error, and in the in the, the the evaluation will return an error and will signal to user the error. But then it's up to the implement, uh, sorry, to the let's say to to the user, so to the subscription implementer, for example, to decide whether the uh, the, the error is pass or not pass. That's what I'm saying. Now, yeah, you you took. Quite a good example, I have to say. Yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> I have to be honest. You took a quite a good example, but pick a, pick whatever. Uh, like a, no, 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 no. I'm going to stick with division by zero because that's hard. I mean, it used to be. It used to be. It, I, I don't know if anybody here remembers, but back in the in the early PC days, division by zero was such a difficult problem that the PC stopped working when you did one. They didn't that didn't interrupt for yeah. so so it's it is a, like there is if you have those expressions yeah exactly here we go back in the olden days um, but uh, um, so th there are there are error situations which don't yield true or false and and I think for for the purposes that we have here where we really want to have a ultimately we need to have a filter expression language. I'm not sure whether overloading 
um, every operation with a special definition that is like, if you encounter an error here, then you are true and then you're false. Well, that is something that developers will understand because developers usually don't read the spec. They go and say, oh, this is SQL. And then they're going to say, okay, this is SQL. So I'm just going to go and do SQL. But then if you, so now you're throwing up uh, effectively side, ef side effects for error conditions that might be just too complicated for, for, for the purpose here. I'm doing, uh, my, my idea was to do the exact opposite, to remove side effects. And so, so the, the, the expression, what, what you're seeing is that the expression can return three different states. True, false error, right? Yeah. yeah, I'm saying that it should be four states. So true, no error, false, no error, true error, false, no, uh, false error. And then it's up to, let's say to the subscription implementer to say, hey, error is false or hey, error is true. That's what I'm saying. I, I, I'm not saying we shouldn't have errors and errors actually exist. So, and there is yeah. a signal. Uh, I'm having trouble with the I'm having trouble with the combination of true and error. Like, how can you know that an expression overall is true if you had a single error evaluating it? Because then you can't know whether the the intended result was true or false. Like, it can never be true. Well, if the operator always define, uh, if every function and operator are total, there is always a return value. In, on, it's defined in every input. There's also, there's the, 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 the also doing total evaluation is if you already, so you're, you're running through an expression tree and you already know when you are hitting the first condition, you have a short condition and then, and then that is false. And then you have an and and follows is a complex a complex expression. Are you going to run through all of that? If I want to return with that, uh, um, if, if I want to continue the evaluation after the first error, I can do that. No, no, no. I mean, I mean, you do, like like you have a log logical expression. If expression A and okay. expression B, well, B is a very complex nested further logical okay. tree. Okay. Okay. And A is false. Okay. Are you going to go and even touch B? Because, uh, because no, you know that you no, can no longer course, be... Of course, of course no, but that, that is a, a completely different point. You're, you're talking about short circuiting, and that's a different point. I'm not talking about short circuiting here. Okay. Yeah, I mean, short circuiting is, is implied in the, definition okay. of the, in the definition of the operator. So, but, so I, I think if you are running into an error in, in any condition, you can never return false as a result, uh, true as a result. That's not true. Like, for, um, think for example, um, an input value is not there. Like for example, I'm assuming there is an extension in the event, but there isn't, okay? That's, that's one of the, that's what, uh, when, when I thought that this error system I, I had this specifically problem in mind. So you wanna um, evaluate an expression uh, where you're assuming that there is an extension and you are not checking with exists if the, if the extension is there or not. So you just try to use it. And because of the definition of how you address extensions, you get a retu uh, default return value. But at the same time, it raises an error. So when you end up with the evaluation, you may have true or false, Okay, because maybe um, it was just checking that, I don't know, string length uh, less than uh, 10. Okay, if the, if the, the assumption, uh, sorry, if uh, when, you, when you address uh, an extension that is not there and that extension is a string, uh, sorry, and the extension is not there, then it returns a default empty string. Okay, so this evaluation will return true. Okay, because this predicate is valid, but it will return an error. And, the, and, and this error will tell you, hey, you're trying to, to do, mm, uh, you're trying to evaluate a predicate on something that doesn't exist. So, and, th and this thing might be reasonable for uh, a, a subscription implementer to pass. 
Okay, for a filter, this may be valid. Yeah, I'm I'm having a hard time I'm having a hard time letting anything pass if there's an error in the evaluation. Like that for me, that's a fault, as as Doug just wrote in, in, in the chat. An error for him is an implied false, and that's 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 the same same for me as well. Like I, I, I said, I, I don't believe the I don't believe the true and and error combination is something that um, I would I would let pass in the product. Well, you, you can always you can always then go and when you use this uh, language, you just assume error equal to false, and the, and you sure see quick errors. So you won't go. Uh, so after you reach the first error, you just drop the whole computation and return the error. You can do that. From from a spec point of view, I'm saying uh, you could do both. It's up to you. But for interrupt's sake, wouldn't you need to have the spec be clear about which one? You know what what happens in the error case. Otherwise, you're not going to have interoperability, right? Two different endpoints are going to return different set of uh, filter results. Well, but that this this spec is about the language. When we will go to to work on the interop with subscription, we can just write in the subscription error equal to false. If, oh, I see. What or you mean. or if there is some flag, say uh, errors are uh, false. The, I'm, I just invented a bad name, <laughs> but you get the point. Then uh, error equal false. Okay. Okay. No. Yeah. If you, when you think about things as a language separate from the other spec, then I understand where you're coming from a little. But I still need to think about it. But okay, that helps. Thank you. Yeah, and also, uh, also don't forget that we one of the reasons we are looking at this expression language is also for workflow people. So. For the uh, workflow spec is interested in this, so right. for them it may make uh, again it may make sense then. True. Okay, so anything else at a high level that you'd like to bring up, or any questions from the audience? Do you make it clear that we need to look at this independent of the other specs as, as a filtering language that could be used for, or I'm sorry, as a expression language that could be used for other purposes besides just filtering? Uh, um, I don't know if I brought it in the document, but I brought, uh, one of the first comment that I did in the PR is that there is a paragraph that I, um, about, um, about how this plays with subscription API and I, and I said that we should revisit this after we merge the PR. So. Okay. Okay. Yep. Because I, I, because yeah, it was lost on me that this would be used outside of filtering. That's why my mind was stuck in that mode of true or false for everything. Yeah. Okay. I, also brought, I also brought in the in the comment that Clements uh, did about the, the name of the spec itself. Yep. yep. Um, just just as a from from a practical matter of of how this might get used, the. The way how I'm using the three states of the of the that come out of the filter is, if the filter is true, I'm selecting the message. If the filter is false, I'm not selecting the message. And if the filter throws an error, I'm going to put the message into a dead letter queue or a dead letter um, place, so that the message can be investigated. So I know what to do with those three states. From our subscription spec perspective, though, I would assume that error is the same as false, and that the fact that you're going to put error messages into a dead letter queue is sort of an implementation detail. Uh, yeah, but I need to have that. That that's something that I need to have all of the filter. I need I need for the filter to tell me whether the evaluation was false and successful, or whether it failed, um, because that message was was causing the the was effectively running against a filter and would never be would never be true interesting can you open up an issue or pr to to add whatever language you think is appropriate to the spec then so we don't lose track of that uh huh is that a yes or a no or well i did repeat the question oh can you open up an issue or a pr for the subscription spec so we can add that or, or discuss whether we want to add that or not Okay. Thank you. 
All right. Any other top? Any other questions, comments on the um, on this PR? If I might, I, I uh, yeah. saw that there was a response, and it felt like it was fairly high level. I'm I've definitely learned that there's a greater context and intention for this uh, expression language, but uh, if Slinky, if you could speak to the question that uh, Doug posed and I kind of uh, added on to about why we wouldn't adopt um, something that's a little more of a standards with uh, standard with uh, libraries existing. Um, I, I'd uh, like to understand your your thinking about that a little better. Slinky. Oh, to be honest, I think I wrote everything in the comment. <laughs> I, I don't know what else uh, you, you you want to know about. Uh, if you can be a bit more specific. Eric, is there is there a specific sentence in here that you'd like him to expand on? I, I haven't fully processed this, Don, to be honest. Um, I, I think, I, I, I suppose I thought that uh, the, uh, some of the SQL specs um, would be sufficient for our use cases. And um, I, I guess I'm wondering how, in what ways they weren't uh, sufficient such that we need to go through defining a, a language and implementing uh, libraries and all kind of all the, the labor and effort that goes along with that. I, I, I can talk to that um, because there's, there, I mean, there, there, because there's prior art in two, in two um, ways. So JMS started to do a subset of, of SQL. And the reason why they had to go and write their own spec is um, that they're only relying on the effectively the, the where the condition, the where clause, and they scoped everything out. So you need to have, so first of all, you need to have an extra spec that is just capturing all the conditions that you want. And then second, SQL is very rich in terms of what you can do in terms of pre-built pre functions and et cetera. And many of those are not desirable for all kinds of reasons in the message broker because they end up being too complicated. So um, that also got cut down. So, so, so in, in that way, the JMS message selectors are a profile of SQL um, because they're, they're effectively scoping that down. And then there are, um, there's a more constrained type model um, that is in, in GMS um, for in, in terms of what message properties can, can uh, occur. And then the select clause of um, um, of SQL is absent, which means the set of properties or the set of fields that you can operate on is something that is effectively given by um, the message itself. Um, and so you need to have this. You need to have in the specification. You need to define. Um, what the message properties are, what, 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 what is the, the space and what are the properties that you can actually operate on. And so all of that taken together is causing the GMS spec to have a, its own definition of, um, of SQL, more or less. And then we've effectively borrowed that approach, um, but as a clean room der derivative of SQL because, of, um, because GMS has been defined by Oracle is, is, has all kinds of in interesting um, uh, uh, um, rights associated with it. So we went for MQP and did a clean, clean um, um, definition of us of the SQL language, but effectively with the same constraints. Cut it down to um, exactly what's needed um, and scope out all, all, all kinds of complicated functions and then effectively define the input set to be the MQP message. So what Slinky is doing here is effectively the same thing. He's saying the input set for the condition is are the attributes of the cloud event. Um, he's constraining that down to a particular um, um, type system, and then it's effectively simplifying the, the the operator model such that it's it's scoped to the type system that exists. 
So that's that there's there's three time precedent for a uh, two time precedent for what Snake is doing here. So, so Clemens, <clears throat> the, go ahead, Eric. Sorry. The, the question was, uh, why, why wouldn't we use one of the precedents? Uh, uh, I, and so, total ignorance. Um, I, that's why I think Slinky has been also has been borrowing um, uh, some language from the NQP spec. <laughs> um, so, so um, I think I think we're leaning on the precedent here, on the NQP precedent here, um, and um, are using some of those constructs. And my uh, so my ideal outcome of this here is that this dialect here and the NQP dialect are. Um, effectively compatible with each other, but that this one is simple. This one, because of the more constrained, the, the this one being more constrained to the, the the cloud event and the cloud event being structurally simpler than than the NQP message uh, um, that the, that we can um, um, that this implement the, the language here is simpler and is is easier to implement. And you don't have you have fewer moving parts. We have more moving parts in the in the MQP um, in the MQP filters. But it would be great if the if this was a true super a su true subset of uh, of the MQP filters. And I think that would that would that would that would then achieve what you're what you're looking for. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that knowledge. I couldn't have accessed it. Yeah, so, but so maybe. The let me try to get a, a crisper answer, right? Because like, you kept talking about subsets, profiles, and stuff like that. Is what's defined in here today a true subset or profile, or does it add things that other SQL specs don't have? And the one thing that is that Slinky added was the um, um, are the, the typecasts, which work differently in SQL, and mostly SQL tries to avoid them. Um, entirely uh, with type inference, so so you use casts in SQL in in cases where you just can't get out of uh, can't get uh, can't avoid them completely. Um, but the constraints we have here with our type system, which is effectively consisting of strings, booleans, and um, uh, and ints, um, even though we have a time type, and so therefore we need to go and add time here. And we haven't, that's a comment that I forgot to add. Um, so but we're effectively just dealing with four types. And with most of those types, we will be able to deal with inference um, for most expressions so that the typecasts as they are, um, are probably not necessary, I think. Um, but everything else is, is pretty much along the lines of what standard SQL looks like. Sorry, okay. Sorry. What, 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 uh, what comment you forgot to add? And um, we need to have a time type. At uh, the time type, yeah. Oh, well, I, I, I kept it out of the discussion for the moment. Yeah, On I'm purpose. just putting it into the discussion. On purpose. So, <laughs> uh, I, if we, uh, I would love to, to add it later after we go forward with this one. Okay. I mean, let, cool. Let's go, I, I would love to go step by step if we can. So. Yeah, and that, <clears throat> that makes sense. All right. I think we might have covered everything on here, but let me just ask one last time. Any other high level questions or comments? Otherwise, we'll just take it offline and work in the PR. All right, cool. Thank you, Slinky, for starting this. That's very good. Um, Eric, did you want to talk about this or did you want to take it offline? I think there are a couple of questions that have been added offline. Uh, do you want to continue offline or do you want to do a little bit of discussion here on the call? It's up to you. Uh, I'm. I did a good job lathering on last week, so I'm. I'm sure if anyone has questions, I. I well, I'm willing to talk about those, but um, I. I don't feel that we need to. Okay, I don't mind doing mine offline. I think Clemens, you said you made a comment. Did you want to comment here, Clemens, or do you want to just do it offline? Um, I think this is a good. I think that's a good discussion to have to just continue to continue offline. Um, and what is. What does GitHub do there with the ads and stuff? Anyways, um, yeah, it's internet. <laughs> uh, oh, okay, great. So, um, yeah, I, I'd like I like for I, I think that's a good good discussion to have to have there. 
um, to kind of land in the middle because um, I think there were, Eric had some uh, a fairly complex uh, thoughts here. I would like to see some examples of the um, you know, aggregates and, and various domain systems. And I just gave an example uh, here with um, how, we're how we've been thinking about this in OPC. And um, yeah, let's 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 dissect this a little bit more in in, in writing. Okay, you can take it offline. Cool. Okay, in that case, Clement, I believe you had a discovery topic you want to bring up. Did you want to share your screen or? Yeah, I just want to I want to share a slide and just briefly to talk about some thoughts here. Okay, there you go. Um, sharing the slide. Sharing the slide. Oh, now I see the button of sharing the slide. Let me see. Um, that is the right picture. Okay. Can you see it? Yep. Fabulous. All right. So, um, the reason I want to show this is just for, um, uh, because this might be a non, a non obvious um, scenario. Um, we have this. Um, so we have a customer called Fabricam that Klaus works at, and um, it's not Fabricam, but you know we protect our our client relationships, and so um, and they are building fairly complex software, and that complex software wants to make um, use of EventGrid in our in our world to go and publish events into an Azure subscription, and the problem is that those Azure subscriptions are their own boundary. And um, if you want to go and deal with identities, etc., then you are effectively all within that in that tenant um, and within that subscription, um, that's where your that's where your scope is. And, and and we want to keep the tenant isolation. So we have this thing we call um, partner topics, which allows you as a as another tenant, because these are both you know, Fabricam is a customer of Azure, and then Contoso is a customer of Azure. And what Fabricam wants to do is they want to go and publish from their application that lives inside of Azure or outside of Azure, and they want to go and publish into someone else's subscription. So we need to kind of tunnel those things. Um, so now discovery becomes interesting because here in Fabricam, the Fabricam app has a subscriber endpoint and it has a discovery endpoint. And discovery endpoint provides information about what's available from, from this Fabricam app um, to others to subscribe. And what they want to do is they want to go and deliver from that Fabricam app somehow events into this application that sits over here in Contoso. But since they can't, they can't reach over here directly because there's different security scopes, et cetera, et cetera they are um, effectively required to use this bridging mechanism. AWS has something very similar that they call EventBridge. Um, and so EventGrid, our EventGrid partner, partner um, infrastructure is, is the same thing. It's effectively how, how can you go and deliver events from one tenant space to another tenant space and allow over here in Contoso, right? This person, needs to be authorized to subscribe to those events, but those authorization rules can only be expressed within the scope. So there's there's gotta be an administrator which says, yeah, over here in this application, you can go and subscribe to events from Fabricam, but that all happens inside of here. And so, and because of that, we need to have this, we need to have, we need to have this bridging mechanism. So um, that all set as, as set up, um, what, what we're thinking about right now in, in terms of discovery and subscriptions is the following, that we're gonna, as you are registering, as you're saying, you know, I want this application to be available um, for event subscriptions over here, that you are effectively telling um, this thing, this partner topic, that there's a discovery endpoint in a subscriber or, endpoint over here in this application. And then the developer here or the automated application will talk to a discovery endpoint, which is put up by this partner topic, 
but it's really a proxy to this discovery endpoint over here. So you're getting all the events that are being made available, all the services that are being made available through this discovery endpoint, you get, get them kind of proxied into this space. And what we're doing in this proxy is we're gonna rewrite all the subscription URIs such that they point to this subscription endpoint. So, so all the events and everything that's available is gonna be original, but then we're gonna effectively fake up the subscri subscription endpoint and redirect that to here. Um, and then if you want to go and subscribe, you come to our um, endpoint, and then our endpoint will walk up to that subscriber endpoint over here and we'll say, hey, Fabricam app, you can now start emitting events. It will go and turn around and will uh, and, and we will tell it to go and deliver those events into this uh, event shoot here that we have in this um, uh, um, platform level endpoint. And then um, once that succeeds, we now have that correctly set up so that Fabricam will start pushing events into this platform level um, uh, endpoint, which has a filter set up so that it will go and deliver into this um, topic, which is then you know in this Azure subscription. And then once that succeeds, we will then go and set up the subscription from here into the application that the developer actually wanted. But the developer will basically go and say, subscribe me if the events, subscribe me these events into this function. That's all the developer will say. And then from the background, we will go and then go and trigger the Fabricam app to go and deliver events to us. And then we will go and then um, react to a successful subscription by actually setting up the subscription here. If you unsubscribe, then we're going to do the, the we're going to undo that, 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 um, that flow. So I just want to, so that's, that's the thing I just want to explain to you on how we, how we think the, we might go and compose the discovery endpoint into the subscriber endpoint such that you can subscribe through a proxying infrastructure, effectively through one of those, those kinds of event bridges. Um, into an application while keeping those scopes separate. Yeah. Questions? Yeah, my hands up. So just so I make sure I understand, it's actually your proxy, your discovery proxy endpoint on the left hand side that's talking to the right hand side discovery endpoint to figure out who he was going to proxy, right? It's not going through the green box to do the discovery stuff, right? Um, we haven't decided yet what exactly that flow is because that might be, that might, so this is all of these are logical lines at this point. Okay. Um, because there might be some firewalling happening here and, and it's not the same networking scope. So, so that's not exactly figured out yet, but logically, yes. So this discovery endpoint proxy is talking to the discovery endpoint over here to go and drag up all the, the information about what's available and what you can go and subscribe to. And then it rewrites those subscription endpoints to point to here so that we can then go and do the subscription dance. Yep. Okay, cool. And just, just a comment then. I think it was Remy who actually had a scenario very similar to this, where he had a gateway type thing where the his subscribers only know about the gateway, and all the produce and event producers behind the scenes are basically hidden to the end user. This sounds very very similar to me, so I think this this could be a popular scenario since I think other people have mentioned it or starting yeah. to mention it as well. So that's cool. Yeah. yeah so I I, went, I I just want to want to uh, um, make that transparent that, that that's how we're how we're currently considering that. And that's also, so because there was, I think there was also, there was also a point that Eric made to, to a degree. It's like, how do you, how do you propagate subscriptions? And that's kind of the a one level subscription propagation, if you will, where you are interested in events from, from a, from, from a source that's one hop away from you. Um, and how do you make sure that this, this application here doesn't need to go and publish everything it knows and all the events over here, just so that the, they are available for subscription over here. That's kind of how we're trying to, how we're uh, approaching the optimization of that flow. Okay. All right, and now we'll unshare. Well, wait, are, are there other questions or comments for comments? All right, not hearing any, cool. Thank you, Clemens. Uh, just one last question though. Oops, sorry, I'm sharing the wrong screen. Are there any, as of now, have you experienced, or have you come across anything that leads you to believe that we need to make changes to the specs to support this? No, um, that's the interesting part. So I think I think these the specs 
SDR hold up because we can we can get away with just manipulating the discovery the discovery um, data that we're getting back. Um, there there will be impact. Uh, I can promise you already in terms of how we're doing the authorization pieces. I think for the discovery subscription and and um, service registry APIs. Uh, we'll have to be a bit more concrete on on um, authorization than we have been with Cloud Events Core, and also with web hooks, because um, those those relationships with uh, that I had in the picture um, can get fairly complicated. And the only the only thing we have uh, right now in in the standard space that can approach. Uh, um, that is uh, the OpenID Connect Plus OAuth. So I think we're um, we we should go and double down on those mechanisms. We don't need to be particular about what grants and claims, etc. We need, but having the right set of fields, which means you need to have an access token um, or a refresh token, um, and those things stored and and talk and and talking about that will be very very helpful. Unless someone someone says, "Yeah, I have an authentication authorization framework that is also standardized, is much better than that." I think we need to leave the authentication part quite open, also because there is so many different type of authentication that I don't think we should uh, like uh, nail it down to only one. Authorize authorization authentication. There's a hundred, there's hundred thousand things, but in terms of authorization frameworks, there's not a lot of choice. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. I need to see the concrete part. <laughs> Klaus, did you want to say something? Uh, yeah. So um, it's also quite similar to uh, I, I remember in the beginning when we started discussing discovery and subscription, I was talking about eventing domains, forwarding subscriptions, and discovery right. data to each other. So it's also that direction, I think. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you, you had you had a you had a picture that was fairly similar to this one. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and thinking and thinking through thinking through that scenario again, that's where I'm landing. I'm also I'm also worried about. Um, um, you know, in the discussions that we're, we're having without disclosing too much, um, there has been an awful, awfully large number of boxes on, on one Visio diagram, which um, um, is a little scary. And so I'm trying to figure out how, how to deal with the least, least possible number of, of elements in this game. Um, and that's kind of how I'm, I'm landing there. Right. All right, cool. Thank you, Clemens, for all that. It's nice to know that the, the spec doesn't need to change as of right now, aside from your credential stuff you mentioned last week. Um, okay, that's it for the main agenda. Uh, just a nagging reminder for these folks, Clemens and Lance, you guys have some things to work on. And in terms of any of the business, I believe Slinky, you had something you wanted to mention. Uh, yeah, just want to mention that uh, I've released the SDK Java V2, so. Mm -hmm. Very good. All right, thank you. Um, with that, we're at the end of the agenda. Are there any other topics people would like to bring up? All right, not hearing any. Lucas, are you there? Yes, I'm here. All right, did I miss anybody else for the attendee list? I think I starred everybody. All right, not hearing anything. Then everybody's free to go unless you'd like to hang out for the discovery interrupt call, which will start in about a minute or so. Okay, thanks everybody for joining. We'll talk again next week. Have a good day. Uh, we lost Scott, that's a bummer. All right, why don't we go ahead and get started? I don't think we have a lot to talk about here. Um, not sure where to begin. So let me, let me start with a question. I know, as I think, Clemens, you're, you've probably been doing some coding recently because you keep hinting at it. 
uh, for him, for Clemens or anybody else, are there any questions, comments, anybody wants to bring up relative to actually coding up the scenario itself? Anything you want to mention? Okay, not hearing anything. I'm just going to assume it's just a matter of people finding time to, to do the work. Yes. All right. So it's, that's fine. I'm, I'm in the same boat. I unfortunately have not touched keyboard relative to this in quite a while. So then I think the question is, do we want to import, Im, impose? Do we want to impose a forcing function to, to move this along? Like pick a date for when we want to do an interop. Because I know originally we picked a date in November, which obviously we did not do. But do we want to pick a date to try to force us? Or is it too premature because some specs are too much in flux right now, like like the subscription spec is going through some major changes and stuff like that. What do you guys think? Um, I, I like the date because <laughs> it puts <laughs> pressure and without pressure, I'm kind of a lazy boy. So. Uh, <laughs> yeah, without priorities, that's like on top of yeah. the pie. Yeah. I agree, we should set a date, but this, we should, should set the date a little bit out. But um, yeah, we should, we should have that. I have a um, I have a discovery endpoint now that I'm not sharing yet, but yes. So we should we should we should set a date, um, but we'll need to have a, I need to have a little time to to get time. I only get tiny slices uh, every week to kind of deal with them. Do you want? What, what about like uh, the KubeCon date? <laughs> I don't know. So I can. What just, is KubeCon? Uh, if I have to talk. I, I can't remember. I can. What is it, KubeCon? I think it's in May. Yeah, EU is like in May, no beginning yeah, of May. May fourth. Yeah, May fourth through seventh. That's a little. That's I think that's a little far. It's too far. <laughs> it's it's good. It's good. I mean, that that would be that would be great if we could go and shoot. If, if so, yes. If that's a target date for 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 saying, yeah, we show we we tested this out and it works. That's 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 good. I think we should go and yeah, try to that was my point. Earlier. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So I do agree with you. That was like my uh, target with the scope that you just said. So <laughs> it would be nice to have something that works. So effectively, uh, yeah, we need to be done before because it's not going to work for first try, I guess. So if, we, if I understood you guys correctly there, you were saying make the end of the interop testing be KubeCon, uh, but so then we need of, to pick a start yeah. date. So I think end of March, we should be all ready and then do the testing during April. Yeah, no? yeah I agree. Okay. Like, because other than end of March, I mean, we're already end of February. So, and with our pace, uh, I think it's already a short time. <laughs> that's that's okay. true. This is, this is a fast progressing standards body. I, so it's, it's okay. Okay. I just, I heard impatience. So, <laughs> anybody have any comments on these dates? As a, at least a, as a rough guess. Obviously, we need more people to to chime in. Are you asking to do uh, like demos after March or after starting March? I think the so the way I'm interpreting it is starting end of March is when people should have their endpoints up to start doing some banging on each other, and between that date and KubeCon is when we basically do debugging and possibly pretty things up so that if we decide we want to show something at KubeCon, we can. And that's the way I'm interpreting it, but maybe I went too far with the show something part, but what do you guys think? No, I think it's good. Uh, that's the way I see it. Uh, because I think I'm the one talking, or at least for one part. <laughs> so if I have more material, I'd, I'd be happy. <laughs> Is that sound okay, David? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, any other comments or? worries about these dates? Okay. I will try to remember to mention this on next week's phone call since I know people like Scott, I think has a conflict uh, periodically with this call. So he may not, notice this, may not notice these dates. So I'll try to remember to put it on next week's agenda to make sure people are aware of it and see if there are any concerns. Okay. Yeah. Just, just for, uh, just for as, a, as, a, as a tiny preview, what I'm doing is I'm effectively doing a, um, I take an entire Azure resource group um, and we'll go and fill it with stuff that goes and raises events. 
and then you'll be able to get the the actual events that are raised by the product. You will be able to go discover those and um, and subscribe to them through the through our subscription API here. So I'm trying to make this as real as possible as it would be with Azure. I was going to say real is good. That sounds cool. Yeah, I have to, and and I'm also going to publish. Uh, of course, I'm going to publish the code. So we will see how much I have to go and fake up, which is a ton, but. Um, that's that's pretty close to how the events are going to show show up later. Cool. All right. Any other topics people want to bring up relative to interop? Then I think it's just a matter of finding time, as I said. All right. In that case, I think we are done for the day. <clears throat> right around time and, of the hour. And don't forget, there's a Mars rover landing tonight or actually today for you. It's landing on Mars? On Mars, NASA Perseverance is landing today. I did not know that, interesting. Well, now you know, so it's uh, it's gonna land at um, 10 my time. So that's gonna be whatever, 3.55, I think your time. Yeah, around four o'clock then, interesting. Yeah. So just out of curiosity, when did it actually take off? A uh, half a year ago. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, this is the time that, that's, so there, there was a, a Chinese um, orbiter, a UAE orbiter, and, and yet another orbiter, which all arrived kind of within the week, because this is the week where the, the Earth and Mars are the closest effectively, or at least from the trajectory perspective, and that's why they all they all show up now in this week. Hmm. And, and do you know, what, what, is the, what is the thing gonna do when it's on Mars? Uh, its mission is its mission is to to now finally detect life. It also has microphones for the first time, and it has the Mars helicopter. Helicopter. Yes. That's cool. It, it's, I was I was at I was at um, I was at Jeff Bezos' first uh, Mars conference, and um, that was in that was 2016, and uh, there they were already showing off the the Mars helicopter concept and we're talking about how they were testing it, um, which is quite interesting because Mars has an atmosphere which is like the a tenth of the density of Earth um, with uh, a third of the gravity. And so doing the testing of the helicopter, whether it would actually fly with the combination of these factors mm -hmm. is, is really difficult. So they've been testing this in, 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 in half vacuum tanks that they were uh, then um, throw, that they were floating in tanks and all kept doing, throwing them off, off uh, um, uh, towers and all kinds of stuff. Just to, just to have the right environmental conditions to see whether they can get the thing to fly. Yeah, I was wondering about that. And then the 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 fact they have a microphone that that should be really interesting to see what it sounds like over there. Yeah. That's that's going to be so cool. So well, thanks is, for bringing that up. Yeah, that is cool. All right, any other cool topics we want to bring up? <laughs> <laughs> it's probably the most exciting thing we talked about all day. That's neat. That's yeah. That's what that's what I'm going to do. That's what I'm going to do pretty much now. Yeah. All right. In that case, let's call it a day. Thank you all for all joining. Right. We'll talk again next week. Bye. Bye. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye.